But lovely to see you all. Uh, my name's Paul. I'm the rector here at St. Paul's. So it's quite easy to remember my name. St. Paul's, Paul to St. Paul's. And that we have three VIPs here today. Three, not just one. You may have spotted one at the front. Do you want to give us a wave, Bishop John? You can, you'll be coming up in a minute. But if you want to, uh, we have Bishop John, Bishop of Selby here. Oh, you Still are wave. a VIP. <laughs> and also, we have another John here, because my, my mum and dad are here. So uh, John and Rory, they're there in the middle. I'm sorry, you didn't get a round of applause, Bishop. <laughs> Don't take it personally. So if you want to learn some things more about what we're talking about in our service today, which I'll let you know what that is shortly, uh, then you can speak to Bishop John. If you want to know more about me as a child, you can speak to my mum and dad at the end. Um, just so you know as well, because I know uh, we communicated last week, obviously we've changed the structure of the service slightly from what it has been over the last couple of months. So we are still going to have an all-age section at the start, so it'll be about 15 to 20 minutes at the start, which will be an all-age section, and then we'll move straight into our next service. So what will happen then is the families as able, if they want to go down to the crypt, so we haven't got proper Sunday school started yet, um, but if you want to go down there, there will be some activities you can join in with. Uh, youth group will be meeting upstairs as well, and you'll go out in the second song. At the end of the second song, I'll pray for you, and you can go to your groups. And uh, as soon as possible, we will be getting Sunday school up and going. So if any of you got that yearning desire to help in the Sunday school, then uh, do let us know. That would be great. So let's begin with our words of greeting. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us recognize his presence with us. As God's people we have gathered, let us worship him together. Wonderful. So I'm going to encourage you to stand as you are able, and we're going to sing our first song. Are there actions for this one? Actions, yes. So I can't remember them. My God is so big. Who knows the actions that our God is so big? Come, I'm, if you, come on, anyone who wants to, just come up. It's fine. Oh, it's Bishop, oh, Bishop John's coming up as well. This is good. Oh, come on, any, come, Mum, you can come up. It's fine. I know you just, you know, two of our newbies. Who else put the hand up? Sam's in. Come on. Did you want to come up as well, Amory? No? Yes? No, you're not sure. You might be wobbly. That's the problem, isn't it? Well, I don't know them, so I'm going to leave you lot up here. <laughs> Just to say as well, I forgot to say good morning to those watching live on the stream as well. We are streaming from St. Paul's today, so um, when you're doing your actions, remember to let the people on the stream see them, so you need to make them extra big for us all. Okay. Wonderful. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are big. You are strong. You created this wonderful world. And Lord, we thank you that you are our friend and you are with us now. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Fabulous. So our VIP number one, sorry, you're demoted to two and three parents. VIP number one, Bishop John, would you like to come up? And we thought some people might have some questions uh, for Bishop John. Because the reason Bishop John is here, and I failed to say this, is because today we are launching ourselves St. Paul's as an eco-church. So this is something the PCC have been talking about for, well, a good six months, I think, or so. And actually, this is the start of York Climate Week. Uh, and next Saturday, we have an eco-fair here in the church, so do come along. And uh, so there's about six or seven of us on the eco-group. Unfortunately, some of them aren't able to be here today, but we've got Natalie is one of ours, and Jan is, o- is over there as well. I'm trying to think... I- trying to see anyone else who's on it. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see you there, Jude. Uh, Jude as well. So, uh, yes, so it's great. So we, we really want to push as an eco church. And John, you are a great advocate in the diocese of um, all things green. So that is why John is, Bishop John is going to be here today. And also, and I have to ask this question before we ask any question, other questions, Bishop John is a great cyclist too, aren't you? Not quite up to the same speed as you, but I was on the cross trainer this morning just to make sure I kept up to speed with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I have also cycled to Wydale Hall and back, and I know you did it recently. Oh, I got cramp. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good. but you only did it between Wydale and York. Uh, uh, yes. I did it between Doncaster and Wydale and back. So I think my halo is even bigger than yours. What do you all reckon? Right, all right. So, Bishop John, then, what is the f- what's the furthest you've cycled in one day? Oh, goodness me. I think probably uh, maybe 60, 70 miles. Yes. No, I think I did 80 once. Yes. That's how I found my wife. I went down to Southampton from London and I found her in Winchester, so that was it's it. Not, but not, not, not literally, but <laughs> that's where hitch- I'm... Hitchhiking, was it? <laughs> Thankfully <laughs> not. No, she was unlucky. <laughs> All right, so, so I've just got you on that one then. Thank I've you very much. You yeah, I mean, my... he is actually a much more impressive cyclist than me and I've run out of steam now <laughs> because, uh, as I keep saying to people, you can never guess my age because whatever age I am, I haven't got a grey hair to show for it. So <laughs> it just makes it difficult, doesn't it, to realise how ancient I am. Um, But yes, I love green. I came in green kit, and uh, I like to encourage people to be green, though I'm, like everybody, struggling to find my way in this world and work out how we can balance things out when we can't change everything in in the five minutes, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. So let's see. I know we've got at least one question. Where's William? Uh Do you want to ask a question? I'll bring the microphone to you. Oh, just check. That's on yellow. What is a bishop? What is a bishop? Oh, well, that's a very good thing to think about. Yes, I've been chewing the cud on that for a very long time. (laughs) Basically, a bishop is someone who watches over, um, keeps a watch over the bigger church. So what we do is we keep in touch with our friends like your vicar, Paul, and all over the Diocese of York, which is quite a big area. If you go on your map, you'll see it's from right down near Hull, a place called Holderness, and the Isle of down the bottom there, and then right up to Middlesbrough, and then from Scarborough over to uh, the other side of the A1. And I look after about one third of that for the Archbishop, who is the boss bishop in the whole place. And uh, we pray for you. We work on helping to make good appointments, and I'm really surprised any of you are here, because when I was last here, <laughs> licensing Paul, I thought this might be the last time there'll be anybody in this church. But obviously, he's keeping going well, so that's excellent. But uh, seriously, we keep watch, we pray, we help to select people. We sometimes have to do stuff which is not always easy. And we also try and be the face of the church in the public area. The Archbishop does most of that, but I also try and do that in the Selby area, which is quite a big area, including Tagcaster, Selby, all sorts of places, keeping in touch with the people who run the show, you might say. So that's in a nutshell, a bishop, but... One of the reasons I bring this with me is a, it's a staff, and I don't know whether you've ever seen anybody else with one of those, but it's usually held by a shepherd, you see, and the bishop is a sort of shepherd of the sheep of the church, so maybe that's a good picture to keep in your mind. Wonderful. Great question. Uh, do we have any other questions? If not, I've got a list of them, like I said, but uh, it'd be great if we have got anyone else, or about the environment as well, obviously, because Bishop John's here to speak particularly about the environment. Come on, there must be one or two of you who have a question. No. What about the environmental group? (laughs) All right, I would... 
No, I will do some of my list then. Oh dear, uh, so these are the hard ones, are they? Mm. Right, hang on. So I've done that one. Uh, done that. Why do bishops wear purple? Why do bishops wear purple? Well, it goes back really to the days when the bishops, in a sense, took over responsibility for the social welfare of the uh, Roman Empire. You may know your history books, and the Roman Empire began to fade in our part of the world in the third and fourth centuries after Christ, really. And in terms of the landscape of the time, bishops were the sort of overseeing priests at the time who, who looked after bigger areas, usually towns. And one of the jobs they used to do was do what the senators before in the Roman Empire used to do, which was to look after how the town was organized and look after elements of welfare. Um, and so, in a sense, that was a, became a sort of marker. Um, and purple was, in those days, a, a form of very expensive cloth. So it spoke about, if you like, the value of what people represented in society. So I suppose that's why bishops wore it. But not all bishops do, and it's not required. For example, the archbishops prefer to wear black with the cross on. The cross is the sign that whatever, if you like, the purple speaks of, it speaks about serving people and caring for people in Christ's name and in his way. So it's not just doing it for your own glory or because you happen to like doing it, it's because Christ invites us to live that way and to lead that way. So it goes right back to the earliest days and I think it's a helpful sign now because it just helps people to remember, um, you know, and uh, to keep in touch with that long, long story that we're part of. Wonderful, thank you. Next question, this one is really important. Which football team do you support? That's very difficult because I, I was brought up in Uganda, like the Archbishop oh. of, before the present one, and football was a bit of fun, but I only met people who were crazy about football when I was sent to this foreign country called Scotland at the age of 11 to go to school. Uh, so I never really had a passion team. Um, but having lived in Doncaster for 21 years, I sort of kept an eye on the Doncaster Rovers. Uh, not that I ever necessarily turned up to uh, watch them, I have to be honest but I kept an eye on them, and they're what I called a yo-yo team. You know, they were up one time, down another, <laughs> up one time, down another. But I have to say, I think they did a bit better than York City, but that's just dangerous to say here, isn't it? <laughs> so we need to pray for Bishop John, lots to support York City and Liverpool, of course. Um, so one important question. So this is a question. Why should churches be involved in caring for the environment? Why, why should we bother? About now, do you want the world. sermon now, or do you want it later? You, you, can, <laughs> you, you can do a pocket, a pocket sermon now for our young pe people and children. Okay, no problem. Have... Well, in a sense, it's not our world, is it? Christians believe that it's God's world. We don't, we do use the language of nature, but our, our preferred language, actually, our mother tongue, is to talk about it as creation. That is, it isn't just here by accident or just because it happens to be around. It's here by virtue of God making this world possible. And so it belongs to God, and we are challenged in the Christian story to look after and to live in this world in a way that honors God and cares for that world. So we shouldn't trash the world, because it's not ours to trash. And of course, living in it, if we trash it in terms of our own self-interest, we'll be out the door as well. So the key thing is that this is God's world, and we are called to look after it on, if, in God's way, in, on behalf of God, but also with God. Um, and I think if we keep God at the front rather than ourselves, then we've got a chance. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Bishop John, give him a round of applause as he goes okay. sit down. He'll be back <laughs> later. Natalie. So Natalie's going to come and lead us uh, before we sing our last song before the children go out. And uh, she's going to lead us in a little prayer activity thinking about the environment and our world. Hello, everybody. So, thinking about our world and how we look after it. Now, Bishop John there just used the word create. We are going to create in this prayer time now. We are going to create a prayer vine. So, as you came in, you may have been presented with a leaf. It might have been some funky sort of exotic looking leaf there. It doesn't, not all green. Not everything in this world is green. It might be pink, purple, blue. We're going to make a lovely vine that goes all the way across here. So, 
thinking time. This is some thinking time about what you might want to write your prayer about. Now, we've got the Eco Fair here next Saturday, and I'm really hoping that we can keep this up to remind people as they come in that we as a church are praying for our environment, and that could be all sorts of things. So here's some things to help us think about it. So uh, what might you want to pray about? Let's see. A banana? Well, you might not want to think about bananas as a prayer, but you might want to think about food. How are we going to pray for enough food in this world for people? If we solve the problem of food, we've got a great chance of that thinking about the environment. Would you like to pick something up, Foster? What else have we got in here? What else have we got in here? Oh, we've got a bug. Bug hotels, bugs are really important for us, bees, any pollinators. Maybe you want to pray that we look after our gardens better so we can think about more bugs. Maybe your school or your playgrounds, your local parks, maybe you're thinking about them and the bugs that we've got. Let's see what else we might be thinking about praying for. We have got maybe our parks and our local wildlife areas, our ducks and our local small animals, thinking about what we could use to look after our environment there. It might be thinking about litter in the park areas. It might be thinking about bird boxes, bat boxes. And our last thing, maybe it's cars and pollution. Maybe it's thinking about praying that we can get onto more sustainable fuels more quickly. Maybe it's taking up the challenge to walk to school or our playgrounds more. So thinking about these. It could be anything though. You've all got your own ideas about what it means to look after our environment. So let's create this vine now. If you've got a leaf, if you haven't, there's some more at the back where I'll come down with some as well. Um, if you just give me a wave, I'll come around with some leaves and some pens. And if you can write your prayer on, and then once you've written it, there will be a lovely green piece of string going across here and some pegs. So if you would like to come and peg it up, you can now, or we'll put it up at the end while you're having coffee, when there's a bit more space, feel free to come over and peg your leaf up. And then we'll put this up on display for the Eco Fair so they can see how we as a church are praying for our environment and we've already got the ball rolling. Okay.
Brilliant. While the rest of these vine leaves get brought out, these prayers, I'm going to say a prayer and then we're going to sing again. Uh, so keep bringing them out though, that's fine. So let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for this world. We know that it is your world. And all these prayers for our planet, Lord, we offer them to you now, trusting in your unfailing love and your awesome power. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. I just encourage you to stand again as you're able and we'll sing our next song. The children will, will go out after this song and I'll say a prayer before you go out. But keep bringing your leaves if you've got them. Let our creation sing before the Lord. Now let your nation of the earth rejoice.
fantastic. What a great song. What a great vine we have here. So we'll put this up uh, for next Sunday, which would be lovely to have. But we might put it between these two pillars. We'll, we'll think of the best place for it. So let's just pray for our children and young people as they go out. So Lord God, we thank you for children and young people. And we just ask your blessing upon them as they go and do different activities now that they will learn lots about you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. See you later. So we're going to move into our confession now. Oh. <laughs> so before we sing our next song, we'll have the music still going to be playing. But just kind of have time to reflect on the ways in which we've let God down in this past week. Human sin disfigures the whole creation, which groans with eager longing for God's redemption. We confess our sin in penitence and faith. You delight in creation, its colour and diversity. Yet we have misused the earth and plundered its resources for our own selfish ends. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You have brought order out of chaos, light in darkness, good out of evil. But we have preferred darkness in words and deeds which dishonour God's holy name. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You have showered us with blessings, but we have been grudging towards others and lacking in generosity and word and deed. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, you crown the year with your goodness and you give us the fruits of the earth in their season. Grant that we may use them to your glory, for the relief of those in need and for our own well-being. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Lord, let your love pour over us. Lord, after this 18 months or so we've had, it's been so challenging. Lord, you are being with us. That as we start to meet again as more people, let's really experience your love and your presence together. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Please do take a seat. And Helen, I think, is coming to read for us. Uh, today's reading is Joel chapter 2, and it's verses 21 to 27. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, have eaten. the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the lo locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you, you will know that I am in Israel, and I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. This is the word of the Lord. So as we seated, let's pray as we ask for the Lord to guide us in our reflections today. As we gather in your presence, may your spirit lighten our vision so we may see better what it is to follow you as those who recognize that this world is yours. And we pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. So thank you again for the opportunity to come and be with you and to reflect with you about our care of creation and how we do it. You may be aware that recently in this Diocese of York, which for those of you, as I say, who are not quite up to speed with all this language, it's basically the bit of the Church of England that the Archbishop of York is looking after in this area, uh, his diocese, uh, we've appointed Reverend Jan, Jan Noble to be our Green Ambassador. And Jan has been working with a team of us to try and enable us as a whole set of communities across this part of Yorkshire to begin to think how can we better care for creation and how can we make a difference in a way that honors the Lord who we love and serve. And he and we are in the process of developing, you might say, a strategy for this that we're going to take to our synod, which is when we gather representatives from the whole of the church in this area together to talk about stuff that matters to us we're going to put before them some ideas, some of which you'll see in a minute on the screen behind you. I also want to flag up, if I may at this stage, that on Saturday the 9th of October, we have a Zoom conference, which is called Saying Yes to Life Environment Conference. And it's being led, you might say, by Jan and his team, but Ruth Valerio, known to some of you no doubt from Tear Fund and Eco Church, is coming as the keynote speaker. And I would encourage you, if you haven't yet signed up, to join us. It'll have a keynote speech, then there'll be workshops. You can do two workshops in the day looking at different themes, electric cars, looking at how to, as it were, look after your um, sort of carbon footprint in that way, and, and a number of others that you can take part in over the course of the day. And it will be a really important moment in our life together to chew the cud on some of the possibilities that face us. And of course, you'll know that in November, we've got COP26 up in Glasgow, and tomorrow, the Young Christian Climate Network Relay Group, who've been walking from Cornwall and are making their way to Glasgow, will be coming through our diocese. 
and I'll be joining them at Bishop Thorpe to walk to the Minster for a service. Uh, and they've been trying to keep that theme on the map. So we are really in a place where all sorts of things are happening in our world, both for good and for ill, that are helping people to think about these issues. Um, if I can have my other slide. Have I lost my slides? That's, that's the beginning one, that's right. And that's why I care for creation. That's the one I want. So the question, really, that you've set for me to engage with you about is why care for creation? And I put some ideas up there. I don't know if you can see them. Creation is good because it's given by God. It draws the source of its identity from God. And therefore, it's something which we should honor, as I was saying earlier when the youngsters were in, because it belongs to God. We are not the owners. We may well be overseers, a little bit like a bishop is the overseer of the diocese, but I no more own the church of this part of the Church of England than anybody else. It's God's church and it's God's world. So we are those who are, as it were, overseers, looking after, but trying to do it in a way that honors the one who the earth and the universe belong to. So it's God's game rather than ours. But also, in looking after the world, we're expressing our worship, that God is worthy and all that God has made possible is worthy of our honor. But we are also, in a sense, acknowledging our priesthood as a people. And that is, we put into vocal terms the praise of the universe. I don't know about you, but I find that the morning prayer starts earlier and earlier in the summer and gets a bit easier as the autumn does, because the birds are at it. You see, you wake up at 2.30 in the morning in a summer's morning and the birds are busy praising God, singing, singing, singing. And all sorts of things are honoring, glorifying God. And what our distinctive calling as Christians and as people actually is to put into words that very song that creation is articulating in its own different languages. And we have therefore to be those who not only express that but live it, which is stewardship that is looking after the world on God's terms. And of course, the thing we have to bear in mind and why we also care for creation is we're part of it. We are embodied beings. We are not spirits who happen to be located in some material matter. That was an ancient misunderstanding that we're still battling with from the Greeks and others. No, we are embodied. That is, we live in the material world as material creatures. And our life in the spirit, our spirituality, is life in the bread and butter of our bodies. And we express what it is to live with God through our bodies in this sort of world. So that's another reason why we care for creation because it's about caring for what God has made possible for us as those who live within this creation. And of course, there's also the question of love and our neighbors. The challenge that the Jewish people faced was love God wholeheartedly, love your neighbor as yourself. And that was passed through Jesus to us as well. And those neighbors, Yes, are other human beings, but they're also those in the created order who are not human beings, but are still our neighbors. And that neighborhood is both the animate, the living, and the inanimate world, because it's the inanimate world that makes possible the soil and the air and so on and so forth for the animate world to live. We're all interdependent, and that is the way God has made possible this sort of world. And of course, then within that love is the whole question of justice. We live pretty affluently here. Those of you who've lived in other parts of the world like I have know how different other people's experience of reality and life is. And one of the pic pictures in my mind that I carry with me from my childhood was children who shared the same color hair as me, ginger. They had ginger hair in Uganda, not because they were healthy as I was, but because they suffered from what was called kwashia kor, which is malnutrition. And they had huge stomachs because they were full of water, because they had not enough food to eat, and they had orange hair because there were problems as a result of their diet, because these were people who normally would have had black hair. So eco-justice is all about saying, how do we work that loving our neighbors, ourselves out in a way that makes it possible for people in the wider world to live in this world fairly and well? Uh, because they are also part of this world that God's made possible. And of course, we have this fifth mark of mission. I won't try and go through all the marks of mission, but they're the five marks that the ch a whole load of churches across the globe have agreed are to shape our lives. And the fifth mark of mission 
is that one written up there, to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. For all of us, there's a certain element of self-interest in this. Yes, we want a future. We want a future for our offspring, and we want a future for a sort of world which is rich in the kaleidoscope of opportunities and offers that God has made possible. But we also, first and foremost, are care for creation because it's God's, and that's the message that comes out of Joel, it comes out of the Bible, it comes out of the Christian story, that we are in this world that is not ours, but God's. So let's think a little bit about how we might, in our community, become a more green community, a greener diocese, within which each church is also getting greener. And uh, as you say, I turn up in green as a sort of sign of that, but it's also because my favorite color is green. So if we can just show you, I don't know whether you can see these, they're a little bit small, but there are some focal areas we need to pay attentive to. The first is this whole mission of raising awareness, which is what we're doing today, which is helping to educate one another about the climate crisis and helping people to think, how can I make a difference? God gives us responsibility. He doesn't just say, put your feet up and it'll all get sorted. We have responsibility. Then we will need, in some way, to find a way of measuring our carbon footprint as a church community, uh, both within our local setting, but also in our diocese, and of course, in our Church of England. That is to see what it is that we are up against when it comes to the emissions that are damaging our world which are associated with carbon emissions. Then we also have to find ways of helping one another to reduce those emissions. How do we do it? How can we, as it were, become greener in practical terms? And then involved in that is this whole theme of treasuring, of not seeing the world as just our, as it were, utility to do with whatever makes best sense to us, but as it were, something to treasure on behalf of God. So. What that has led us to as a church, and again, this is slightly small, so I'll just mention it to you, is a, is a resolution that came from our general synod, which is sort of the, the gathering of the Church of England for discussion and deliberation that happens a couple of times a year. And they have set us a challenge to achieve what we call carbon net zero by 2030, which as you'll know is ahead of where the government is going and many other bodies, and in fact, Elements of the church, like the church commissioners, had to say they couldn't quite manage that. But the other bit of the church that we're part of has been set this challenge. And that's a big challenge. And I can tell you that because I'm working with a group of people trying to find ways of helping us to get there. And we're working on a 10-year program to try and get to that point where we can, as it were, balance out the emissions that we have and reduce the emissions that we have and offset those that we can't deal with within that period of time. So this is our challenge, to achieve net zero carbon by 2030. So if we just move to the next slide, you'll see how, well, how are we gonna do that in this area? And this again might be something you want to look at in your local setting. First of all, in terms of the measuring, which I mentioned earlier, we're going to try and find out what is our baseline, what actually is happening at the moment. And the Church of England's produced this thing called a um, energy footprint tool, which you can go through and you can get it online go through and look at the different ways in which you as a community are emitting carbon and then that gives you a sense of where you're starting from. And then you identify those target areas for reducing emissions. That is looking at things like your heating systems and others and saying, could we find another way of doing stuff? How is our electricity being resourced? Could we change or should we change, as many of us would advocate, to a green tariff? that can make a significant difference, in fact, in carbon footprint terms. And in our own diocese, agreeing that we're going to, as it were, green thread everything, or thread everything through a green lens to look at it, to green proof it is the jargon that people use. And then in the next period, from 2024 to 2026, we're suggesting that we try and reduce, literally, our carbon footprint by implementing energy saving measures to reduce the emissions, to encourage, as I say, this switch to 100% renewable electricity and again to keep looking at how we are as a diocese and you in your local setting, trying to work in all the detail of our lives to get our carbon footprint down. And then the last phase is really to aim latterly for changing some of the technology we use, finding ways of 
as it were, using sequestration and providing sustainable offset options for people. And of course, then looking at where people are really making a difference, like yourselves trying to become carbon eco-churches, I should say, and really seeing that and saying, wow, let's affirm and encourage that. So where do we need to reduce these emissions? Well, we can only really be responsible for what we can make a difference about. And you'll see there that in our world of the Diocese of York, we can see our church buildings, like your own here, as one big challenge. Our schools, but we can only make a difference actively in our voluntary aided schools because voluntary controlled schools are in a, under different governance. Um, but we can put pressure on those, as it says in the second section, to do that. And then looking at clergy housing, looking at our offices, looking at our cathedrals and saying, these are the areas we can get a handle on. Let's make a difference there. Um, and as I say, encouraging those areas we can't directly control to move in the same direction. So how might that happen? Well, you can see there the little sum, which I won't talk through, but you can see how those different elements can help us to get as close as we can to carbon net zero by 2030. It is a big order, it's a tall order. Many people in the Church of England's knees were knocking when they decided to make that policy for us. But we are a church that walks together and that's, if you like, our challenge. So if we just move to the next slide, where do we need to reduce emissions? Well, we're working in the Church of England on what are called scope one and scope two emissions. Scope one are those areas of direct emission, energy consumed in our buildings and all work-related staff travel. That's what we can measure. When Paul goes for a visit to your church member in the community, he clocks a mileage up. That mileage can be measured. And depending on what sort of way he goes there, if he's on his bike, then he gets a halo. If he's working with his Jaguar, which is a 4.2 liter job, then he gets a kicking. So, you know, that's the sort of, seriously, that's the sort of measuring thing. And scope two emissions are indirect emissions from purchased energy. That is, if you like, the cost of things from where they start to where they get to us. You know, when you buy something, there's an, a cost not only of, if you like, your use of it, but the whole process of it getting to you. And that is something we also need to look at. And then later, we are going to be looking at what you might call indirect and embodied carbon emissions. Things like when you set up a building project or looking at the sort of items we buy both within church and beyond it. So it's a number of different ways, but we're beginning the journey because we think we can make a difference here most effectively with scope one and scope two. And just to give you a picture of what that looks like on the ground in the Church of England, you can see there that the majority of our emissions are in our schools and in our larger and medium-sized churches. So unfortunately, you're one of the high-emitting churches. Not the highest, but a high one, because you do good stuff, you're open, you've got people coming in, you're using the place for... So it's all about the, the irony of your saintliness becoming a slight challenge in terms of how can you enable that to continue, but in a way that's more uh, carbon friendly. Um, what's also interesting, because I find this as somebody responsible for rural churches in the area, is that actually our rural churches have a very, very low carbon footprint, because often that's where I get the kickback. Well, we've got hardly anybody here, hardly any money, and we, can't, we haven't got the energy. And I say, well, actually, you only effectively together 3% of our carbon problem. And if you were to change your light bulbs into LEDs, or you were to switch to a green tariff for your electricity, actually you probably would reduce that even further. So it's really these two target groups in terms of our buildings, which are secondary schools and large churches. Um, and the others are relatively modest. And the other area, as I mentioned before, is travel. So just trying to give a little bit of a shape to that as we come towards the end, let's put my next slide up. How will we reduce an emissions and action plan? Well, we're hoping that we can get champions in each of our deaneries to keep working with us to get that moving. We want each deanery to engage with Eco Church and to get at least 20% of our churches registered, as you are doing wonderfully today uh, by 2023, and for 10% of them to be awarded. We'd love them to have the gold star, which is where they've made a difference. For, they've filled in the form online and can tick 75% of the good boxes or 50% they get silver, 25% bronze, so let's hope you're going for gold. Uh, and that as an eco-diocese, we work a policy out, and as I say, as a diocese, I think we think we can aim for bronze, I'm afraid, by 2023. 
Uh, and then in terms of the reduction stuff, to move then to get 60% of churches registering, 20% awarded, and the diocese to get to gold. And then hopefully by the end of it, we'll hope that nearly all our churches will be registered and 50% will have been awarded um, the accolade. So that's our plan of action. Um, so we just put up the last penultimate slide. If you are interested in this sort of practical path to net zero carbon for churches, there is a document on the Church of England's website, uh, a couple of them which you can look at, and there are also webinars going on. And as I said at the outset, we also have this conference coming up on the 9th of October. So what I'm praying for for you is that why care for creation? It's God's. We are here as servants of the Lord. We are here to be stewards, to be those who express the worship of the globe and the universe in verbal terms to the God who has made all this possible. And we're here to love our neighbor as ourself <clears throat> and to share this wonderful sense that the world is not our possession, but our gift, and that we are to treasure it as a gift. So may God bless you as you become a green Holgate. And I hope next time I come, you'll like me symbolically turn up dressed in green. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop John. We're going to sing again in a moment. And uh, for some of you maybe you've not heard much about Eco Church yet, that's because we are still in very uh, early days of this, but more information will be coming out. And like I said, if you're interested, then do, please do come to the Eco Fair uh, next Saturday, which will be here as well. Uh, information will, will come out from that. The other thing as well, I just want to add to Bishop John, I hope you don't mind me adding, adding this, but I think for me, Eco Church as well gives us a mission opportunity on top of just that caring for the environment that we're called to do because it's God's world, but actually as a way to be a center, maybe in this community where these things can be discussed. And in those discussions, we build relationships. And in those relationships, we can share God's love as well, not just for the world, but for those people who are coming along as well. So that's very much my heart as well within our own Eco Church journey. Anyway, shall we stand and sing again?
standing as we say the words of a special creation care creed. We say the words together. We believe and trust in God, all-powerful creator and sustainer, who fashions the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, who gazes on his handiwork in love, pronouncing it very good, who crafts men and women, calling us to partnership with him in caring for his world, who provides in generous abundance all that is needed for the whole of creation to thrive, who grieves at the way we neglect and spoil his masterpiece and calls us to account, who, like a loving parent, sees our weakness and yet persists in love, who purposes to restore what is broken and retrieve what is lost. We believe and trust in Jesus Christ, who shared with his Father the wonder and promise of creation tide, who was born like us, choosing to share our humanity with its joy and its pain, who lived an earthly life affirming and celebrating the goodness of the physical world, who used the natural world to teach us more of God's nature, who modeled for us a pattern for living with integrity, even though it cost him everything, who died and came back to life to show us that in sacrifice lie the seeds of freedom and hope, who returned home to his father, his earthly work complete. God, our Father, you are the source of all life and growth. See, we pray for your vision for our planning, your wisdom in our actions, and your power in our witness. Amen. So please do take a seat, and we're going to have our prayers now, if Joyce would like to come out. Sorry, I thought we'd got another song. Um, the response today is, I will say, Lord of all creation, and could you answer with, hear our prayer. Psalm 24, verses 1 to 2. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the, wo the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the waters. Creator God, we belong to you as part of your creation. Thank you for our dependence on you and the rest of your creation for life. Forgive us, Lord, for often exploiting your creation, for failing to rule with love and wisdom. Lord, please help us to heal the damage we have done to your creation so that we may be reconciled to you. Help us to protect the biodiversity of the earth and to enjoy the works of your creation, the birds and animals, the trees and flowers. We pray for endangered species. We ask that you would help scientists to understand the complex problems and be able to take action to save plants and animals in decline. Awaken your church to the needs of the natural world. Inspire us to unite together and care for your creation. Lord of all creation, hear our prayer. A prayer by Ray Simpson, founding guardian of the community of Aden and Hilda. Creator, make us co-workers with you, that the earth and all people who live upon it may reap a full harvest. Show us how to reflect your rhythms in our life and work and to conserve the world's resources. Help us to give all creatures their due respect and to tend cattle and crops with care. Guide science along wise and considerate ways that we may fashion agriculture 
that truly enhances and that we may sustain a, bright, a vibrant environment. Lord of all creation, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for the World Climate Conference taking place in Glasgow at the beginning of November. We pray for the world leaders, climate experts and campaigners as they revisit the Paris Agreement with the aim of uniting the world to tackle climate change. We pray for wisdom, integrity and a sense of common purpose as they strive to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, our, and air pollution, stop deforestation and improve health worldwide. Lord of all creation, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray for our governments, our local councils, our churches and ourselves, that you would give us the will and the courage to simplify the way we live, to reduce the energy we use, to share resources you provide, and to bear the cost of change. Forgive us our past mistakes and send us your spirit with wisdom in present controversies and vision for the future to which you call us. Lord of all creation, hear our prayer. Father God, as we try to make a difference to the world in which we live, help us to care for one another, to take time to listen and to pray for each other, to walk alongside those in need and to share our joy and laughter. Take a moment now to bring before God those you know who need his peace and healing touch today. Lord of all creation, hear our prayer. And now we're going to do two prayers together. The first one is our prayer for growth. God our Father, you are the source of all life and growth. We pray for vision for our planning, your wisdom in our actions, and your power in our witness. That though you that through you, outpouring of your Holy Spirit, St. Paul's and St. Barnabas will grow in numbers in loving service to Holgate, Lehman Road and the city, and in our love and commitment to Jesus Christ. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Joyce. Sorry to throw you out by changing the order slightly. Uh, Bishop John, it'd be lovely if you could come back again. And, and Bishop John's going to pray for us as an eco church. Uh, Jude, would you like to come out? I think no, there's no one else from the eco group here, is there? Because I think two of them are either downstairs or upstairs. So um, as I, we can be the representatives because we're missing uh, the others. But um, Bishop John's got a special sort of commissioning prayer for us. Uh, so you, you stand in the middle. So this is a prayer written by Ray Simpson, which focuses upon this challenge of committing yourself to caring for creation in this deeper, richer way. Creator, make us co-workers with you, that the earth and all who live upon it may reap a full harvest. Show us how to reflect your rhythms in our life and work and to conserve the world's rich resources. Help us to give all creatures their due respect, to tend animals and crops with care. Guide science along wise and considerate ways that we may fashion agriculture that truly enhances and that we may sustain a vibrant environment. 
And as this church commits itself to being an eco-church, may that journey know your blessing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop John. Thank you. So before we have our final song, just a few mes uh, messages, notices. If the band wants to come up there, that would be great. Um, just to let you know, our harvest service will be 10th of October. So have that in your diary. Uh, more information will come out about that soon. Um, also, just that final reminder about the Eco Fair next Saturday. If you'd like to join us for that, that would be lovely. And also, this evening, we have our first encounter service uh, back in person here, and that will be meeting here at 7 o'clock tonight. And we're studying worship from Luke's gospel, as well as doing a lot of worship. And obviously, you can officially sing now during encounter. Uh, <laughs> whereas maybe some unofficial singing that was happening before. But uh, we can certainly officially sing, so do come along if you can. If you've never come to Encounter before, um, it's a service where uh, I, no, we're really trying to encounter God, but we do that through singing, then we have a short reflection, then we also have a 10-minute silence as well. Also, I do, I, now I'm still quite new here myself, but I do see there's a few new faces today, so if you are new uh, to the church, do come and say hello uh, at the end, and if you want to catch up more about environmental um, issues, and do speak to Bishop John as well, I'm not sure exactly how long he's staying around at the end, but um, I'm sure he'll just depart when he needs to, um, but do come and catch him. So let's stand as you're able for our final song.
So as we remain standing, let's receive God's blessing on the journey that is set before us. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. To go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.